All right, good afternoon, I guess, everyone. Um, so today, let me go to the PowerPoint. Hold on, let me first share my screen. <laughs> you can't see what I'm looking at. I hope everyone's doing okay. Uh, I got through the first week of the recorded lectures. Okay, I did get some emails, um, but I think overall um, it went well. Um, so let me start the PowerPoint for today. All right, so today we're going to be covering the Endangered Species Act. Um, today there's no discussion leaders or anything like that. Um, so this will be not a long lecture. I still don't intend on going for an hour 15, um, but this will be mostly a lecture based class. Um, so I do have some reminders and then we'll really just dive right into the Endangered Species Act. So first of all, I really do encourage you all to download the revised syllabus. Um, I've sent out, I think, three different announcements about this. So please do look through your emails. You can go to the Blackboard website and look through the announcements. Um, that'll really help clarify exactly when things are due and some of the changes that we've made. Um, going to this virtual format i even went through and when i revised the syllabus i highlighted the revised pieces um so you'll see that all there i've generally tried to keep things as consistent as possible for what they were before um, so most due dates are still at 2 p.m by class time um, obviously there's some changes and definitely changes of topics that we're covering each day uh, which i did in order to um and just maximize and keep kind of the flow of the class. So please, please do, um, if you're wondering when something's due or what we're covering that day, just go to the syllabus first. If you're still confused, definitely shoot me an email, but please do look at the syllabus first. I've tried to make it as detailed as possible um, so that everyone's clear on what's expected. Okay, so speaking of reminders and due dates, here's a list of things we have coming up in the next few weeks. Um, so discussion leader, seven is on Wednesday. Um, and then we do have assignment number three, which I did go over last lecture, and that is due on April 20th. And then we are gonna do a second pink time. This obviously might be a little more challenging given social distancing restrictions, but I think that actually is an opportunity to get a little extra creative. Um, so there'll be no lecture on April 22nd. And then that same rubric form that's available um, up on Blackboard is due on the 27th, once again. So this is really just the exact same assignment, um, but it gives you a second opportunity to, you know, explore your own interests and how those interests relate to class. Um, so these are kind of some of the upcoming due dates that we have. All right, so for the Endangered Species Act, or as a, you'll see, I'll type out here just as the ESA, um, the learning objectives. So I want you to know what is it, um, how does it work, how is it implemented, and then some of the more recent changes um, that were just implemented last September to the Endangered Species Act. Um, we'll also go over some criticisms, and then I want you to be able to discuss a few case studies. So I have a few videos. We're going to do videos differently because the last two lectures. The sound has just not been coming through very well. Um, so when I get to the videos, I'll tell you what I want you to do. Um, and that's basically the objectives for today. So really this lecture is really just focused on the Endangered Species Act. So why, first of all, what's the issue? Um, really, it's, really it all comes down to extinction. Um, so the Endangered Species Act is meant to keep different species from going extinct. Um, this is just a graph I found as far as different extinctions for different types of animals um, going all the way back to the 1500s. So these are obviously estimates, um, but you can see particularly as the human population started growing, um, you know, these graphs go up quite significantly. Another thing that's important to note out here actually is this background. You can see there's a background line. Um, that just kind of highlights that there is going to be extinction. There's always been extinction that's maybe not related to humans. So having zero extinction is not necessarily the goal, um, but to have extinction that is directly related to human activity to be minimized. So here's another really interesting chart. Um, so they have on the left here, different, once again, different types of plants and animals. Um, and then 
in the red and orange, you have red being critically endangered, orange endangered, um, kind of yellowy orange is vulnerable, um, and then kind of the other categories as well, um, and the percentage of species in each category. Um, so something that's important to look at here is the number of species. So you can see in light gray, they have the number of species on the right hand side. Um, so for some of these types of animals, they've really assessed all of them. So this is the number of extent assessed species, uh, assessed species, sorry. So this is the number of species that have even been assessed. So for things like, um, write down some notes. So like amphibians, they have, there's approximately 6,500 that have been assessed and there's about, assessed I found, I found with other about 7,000 globally. Um, so this is fairly comprehensive. They've looked at all the different amphibians and how many of them are endangered or vulnerable. Um, interesting here that I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce this, but the cycads, that's a type of plant, oops, actually, um, a lot of those are endangered. So that's definitely the, the most threatened group, but probably something that most of you have never heard of. Um, and then for some of these, there's just no way that they can look at every different kind of species. So for example, um, dicots, which are just above amphibians, those are plants that have two flowers. So if you've noticed or ever grown a garden, there's some plants that are root that sprout up and there are two flowers, or sorry, not two flowers, two leaves. Um, and that's what you see, that's what a dicot is. So you can see um, there's only been about 1,800 that have been assessed. When, when I looked it up, there's actually 175,000 different dicots in the world. So there are certain groups that have just not really been looked at very much. Um, and this is another issue because there may be, you know, threatened species, endangered species, extinct species that, you know, science hasn't looked at at all. So this graph, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but this graph and figure is really interesting because it says a lot as far as what types of you know, what types of plants and animals are mostly endangered, but it also says kind of the gaps. So there's a lot of um, room still for science to be looking at all thousands and hundreds of thousands of these different kinds of species. And that's obviously a really quite daunting task <laughs> um, to be able to actually accurately track and study all of these is really a lot of work. So extinction, um, as kind of the last figure was showing, it can be difficult to evaluate and monitor all species with how many plants and animal species there are on this planet. Um, it's really not super feasible um, for scientists to track all of those. So that's one of the problems um, that we have with looking at endangered species is there's a lot of species that are not being monitored. Um, oftentimes plants and smaller organisms can be overlooked. Um, I think when we were focusing more on wildlife conservation, we were looking a lot at the quote unquote charismatic megafauna. So people know about elephants and pandas um, and those kind of things, but they don't know about something like a dicot or a lot of insect species. Um, so this is really kind of uneven as far as being um, kind of geared towards the mammals, the reptiles, amphibians, birds and less so towards plants and insects. Um, it's also kind of hard to assess what is um, the non-anthropogenically influenced extinction. So what kind of extinctions are happening without a direct cause from humans? Um, and kind of establishing that baseline can be quite difficult. So in the figure on the right here, they have the green area, which is this background extinction. Um, <clears throat> and that is something that's really I mean, millions of years ago might have been easier when there weren't people around, but these days it's something that's really quite difficult to, to um, differentiate from human-caused extinctions. Um, so that's basically these last two points here. So the Endangered Species Act, like I said, is largely a call to, you know, keep endangered species or keep species from going extinct. Uh, was originally established like a lot of these national conservation acts in 1973 and there were two acts that preceded it so you have the endangered species preservation act of 1966 and then the endangered species conservation act of 1967 
Um, so originally it started out with mostly wild birds and game animals, um, and then moved to include other types of animals, um, increased punishments, and then eventually came to what it is today in 1973. With some, there's been some modifications since then too. Um, but kind of the modern Endangered Species Act is always um, kind of referred back to as this 1973 Act. So the purpose is to protect and recover imperiled species and the ecosystems upon which they depend. So obviously you can't um, protect a species without protecting its home and without protecting its ecosystem. Um, and the Endangered Species Act is really one of the nation's most significant environmental laws. It has a lot of significant environmental conservation impacts and benefits um, and really quite strict um, regulations, which we'll go into. Um, and it's also one of the more powerful um, in the world, to be honest, as far as protecting, um, as far as a law that protects different plants and animal and other types of species. Um, so the Endangered Species Act is really one of the biggest federal conservation acts, most prominent, most, um, most implemented that we have. Okay, so to give some background, a little more background, I have this video. So instead of me actually trying to show the video, because the last two times it didn't work, um, I put up here the name of the video and the actual link on YouTube. So what I'd like you to do is open up another browser tab in YouTube and go to this video and watch it. It's a very short, I think, four minute video. So at this time point, you can pause the lecture and go ahead and watch that video. All right, so I'm gonna pretend like you wouldn't watch the video. Um, a few kind of key things to point out, which I think are really, really important, are some of the motivations behind the Endangered Species Act. Um, so if you notice in the video, they don't talk about the Endangered Species Act as a way to um, utilize wildlife. They really talk about it as a way, or at least the, the kind of different terms they talk about is pride. So pride that this is the natural heritage of the United States, pride that these are the you know, incredible wildlife and plant species that we have. Um, we also talk about protecting it for future generations. Um, so that's also another thing, and this all really gets back to that kind of intrinsic value. So here in the ESA, um, it really is talking about the inherent value of wildlife that, not just wildlife, um, I'm making the mistake myself as classifying as wildlife, but the inherent value of the different, um, you know, the different biodiversity that we have in the United States, it's not about utilizing it, it's about protecting it. Um, for its own sake, uh, saying that the fact that it exists is valuable in itself. And this is really, really important. So how does it work? So the ESA is administered by two different um, organizational bodies. You have the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which generally is for the land species. And then you have the National Marine Fisher Service, which does fall under NOAA. <clears throat> and that's for the ocean species. Um, Fish and Wildlife Service obviously does cover freshwater as well, so land and freshwater. And then NOAA here you have with the ocean species. Um, and generally species are listed, that are listed are two different types of listings. So there's threatened species. And those are species that are likely to become endangered within the foreseeable future. And then you also have endangered species. So species that are currently right now um, in danger of extinction throughout all or a significant portion of its range. So how does a species become listed? So this is in section four. If you actually go to the full Endangered Species Act, it'll list this out even more, but even in the readings for today, it does talk about this some. Um, so section four is on the basis of their biological status and threats to their existence. So this includes damage to or destruction of a species habitat is a reason why it might be listed. Overutilization of the species for commercial, recreation, scientific, or educational purposes. Disease or predation. 
inadequacy of existing protection, sorry, and then other natural or man-made factors that affect the continued existence of species. So that one's very, very broad, um, but these are the official reasons for why a species could become listed in the Endangered Species Act. There's also a lot of wording in the Endangered Species Act about take, and it can be kind of controversial. Um, so the ESA makes it illegal for a person to take a listed animal without a permit. So what does that mean? Take means virtually anything, as you can see in this definition. So take means to har harass, harm, pursue, hunt, shoot, wound, kill, trap, capture, collect, or attempt to engage in such contact. Um, so this obviously makes the Endangered Species Act really broad and how humans are in interacting and impacting these species also really broad. And this can include habitat modification. So if you're taking an animal because you're modifying their habitat, that is also prohibited under the Endangered Species Act. However, and I found this one interesting and I couldn't really figure out the history behind it, plants are not protected from take necessarily. Um, something that's more allocated for animals. So implementation. So a species might become a candidate for listing. There has to be enough information about them to, propose, to warrant proposing them for listing. So this is kind of the point I was trying to get at earlier as far as gathering all this information and understanding their behavior, their species range, their habitat, does take a lot of scientific research. Um, and that needs to be done before an animal is listed. Take, as I, we just talked about. So recovery plans. So once a species is listed, um, whatever take issues or whatever issues might be threatening them, um, there's a recovery plan written up, which in the case of land is by fifth, Fish and Wildlife Service or FWS biologists and implemented with, with assistance from species experts. So a lot of those scientists that actually did the research originally to get that species listed, as well as other relevant stakeholders. So depending on where that species is located, and there might be government agencies, tribes, NGOs, even private landowners. Um, it just depends on what type of species it is and what kind of the major threat is. And this also includes, can include habitat conservation plans. So this is what Section 10 of the Endangered Species Act talks about. Um, this is particularly with landowners, often private landowners, who want to develop their property or do something with their land um, that's inhabited by a listed species. Uh, and landowners can receive permits to take species, provided that they develop an appropriate habitat conservation plan. So this is um, kind of a piece in there that's a bit of a middle ground for landowners who then might find themselves unable to farm or unable to use their land because they have an endangered species on that land. So this habitat conservation plan is something that then they have to do to show that they are still going to conserve the species while utilizing their land or at least parts of their land. Um, and connecting back to stuff we talked about further, the ESA is basically the US's piece of CITES, which we talked about quite a bit, I don't know, a month ago. Um, so this is the US implementation of CITES for a lot of it, which is why actually there's not just US species, there's also international species listed, on the, listed in the ESA for this reason. So just a few examples of some endangered species in California, move myself. Um, there's quite a few. If you go to the Fish and Wildlife Service website, it lists a lot of the different species by state. Um, so here's just two examples. So you have this bird, um, the Southwestern flycatcher listed in 95. Um, it's really threatened because they really only live and breed in dense riparian areas. So those are areas near rivers and creeks. Um, and these kind of areas are also often highly developed and disturbed. Um, really any species that requires a very specific kind of habitat um, is often more likely to be threatened because if that habitat, you know, 
goes away, they're going to go away. Where species that can live in a, in a kind of more variety or diverse locations um, often will do better. So something kind of cool I found locally was the San Diego fairy shrimp. Um, and they live in vernal pools or basically seasonal wetlands. Um, and many of these areas and wetlands in particular are very vulnerable because um, they're often converted into agricultural areas, things like that. Um, so these fairy shrimp rely on these wetlands, which is why they're protected or why they're um, listed as an endangered species in California. Um, a lot of these vernal pools have been purposely protected for protection of the San Diego fairy shrimp. Um, and these live in San Diego, but also in other parts of Southern California as well. And this is one species where there's been very specific habitat protection in order to, for them specifically, I guess is the right way to say that. Okay, so threatened species. Um, let me just make sure, don't know if my volume matters. Just turn. Okay, so other threatened species in, or these are threatened, sorry, the four that was endangered, these are threatened species in California. So you have the de desert tortoise. Um, this obviously lives in more of the desert parts of California, the Imperial Valley. Um, and this was listed in 1980. And even since it was listed, the populations declined by 90%. Um, really because there are a lot of different types of threats to it, including urbanization, disease, habitat destruction, and illegal collection. Um, the kind of issue behind this is that these desert tortoises only live in certain types of soil because um, they do burrow. They live in these very hot climates, um, and so their range is not it's big, but it's also not big at the same time. They live all over the Southwest, however, only in certain locations. So another one um, is the Southern Sea Otter. Their range is quite wide. I think when I was looking it up, it said from Japan all the way down to Baja, California. So a lot of area in the Pacific. Um, they were listed in 1977, and they're also un recognized under the Marine Mammal Protection Act, as well as the Endangered Species Act. Um, and they're threatened largely due to the risk of oil spills um, and oil tanker traffic is the main reason why they've been listed as threatened. Well, there have been significant population declines throughout history. So even well before the Endangered Species Act, um, their population declined, declined quite significantly due to trapping for fur. Um, and then more recently, since the Endangered Species Act, um, and since it was listed in the 70s, the population has actually recovered quite a bit. So from 50 individuals in California, there were other individuals elsewhere, um, but this is California specific, um, to more than a thousand. And that recovery plan that's part of the ESA um, was adopted in 1982. So there's been some success, at least in, for the Southern Sea Otter, which is good. Those are cute. Look how adorable he is. <laughs> Although I do think the desert tortoise is really cute too. All right, sorry, my screen froze. Slideshow from current slide. Okay. So the, while the ESA and the Endangered Species Act does have a lot of benefits, it doesn't come without um, issues and without being contested by people. Um, so I have two case studies here. This is the first video. Um, it talks about the Oregon spotted frog and ranchers and farmers in Washington um, and really kind of the, the burden, I guess, that these ranchers are facing because they have Oregon spotted frog on their land. Um, so please go ahead. I think this meant videos like four minutes long. Go ahead and watch the video. Okay, so I'm going to pretend like you watched the video. So a few things that are really brought up in this video is 
first of all, it's important, whenever you're looking at things, it's always important to see who, um, who put it together. So this video was put together by the Pacific Legal Foundation. Um, so it is biased in some extent because this is an entity that's um, working, I guess, with those ranchers and farmers in order to litigate or to, to sue the Endangered Species Act, um, which is a fairly common thing to do, unfortunately. So they definitely are coming at it from the viewpoint of the ranchers, um, which is honestly why I like this video too, because it shows that viewpoint a little clearer than you might think. Um, and really the kind of conundrum here is that these landowners are arguing that because they are managing the land in a certain way and have managed the land in a certain way is the only reason why these Oregon spotted frogs exist on their land in the first place. Um, and now because of that, now they're being punished um, and have to spend their time and manage their land again in a certain way to manage for these Oregon spotted frogs. So that's kind of this, they're arguing there's kind of the cycles because they're there and because they're managing the land in a certain way, these frogs exist. But yet because these frogs exist, they're now being regulated against. Um, so that's kind of the issue they take up there. Um, they also talk a bit about threatened versus endangered species. Um, so not anymore, but when this video was, the, was filmed, threatened and endangered species had the same rights to protection. Um, and they're arguing that, that that's not necessarily fair, that threatened species should have maybe some less strict rules with protection because they're not endangered yet. And they also have an issue here with take. Um, so obviously them um, using their land in certain ways or destroying habitat would be a take of the frog. So that's, yeah, that was some of the main points for this video. So here's the second video. We've talked a lot, a lot about wolves in class, so I really liked this example as well. Um, it talks about rangers um, challenging the endangered listing of, or ranchers, sorry, challenging the endangered listing of gray wolves. So go ahead, this one video is like two and a half minutes, I think. Go ahead and watch this video. Okay, and by the way, these titles that I'm putting up here for the video, so Illegal Endangered Species Act regulation, and down here, Rangers Challenge Endangered Listing of Gray Wolves, you should be able to type that into YouTube and find the video immediately. Um, you can also type in um, this actual URL. So there's kind of two ways to look for these videos on YouTube. So I hope that works. Um, please do email me if you think that's not working or if you have a better idea. This is what I'm trying today. So we'll see if this works. Um, as you know, I do really like showing videos in class and I really would like you all to watch these videos and I will refer to them um, later for assignments, exams, things like that as we've done, you know, previously in the first half of the semester. So in this video, it's also produced by the Pacific Legal Foundation. So it has some of the same biases as the first video. Um, the woman in the video, this quote, find really interesting, she says, it's like he has a bulletproof vest on when he's talking, when she's talking about wolves. Um, first of all, it's interesting that she always says he, if you notice that in the video, so she is giving wolves kind of a gender, what impact that has. It's up to you, think about it, but I think that's done kind of purposely. Um, and she's saying that she, you know, has no tools to protect her livestock, and that's not fair. She's saying, you know, if a wolf comes and attacks one of her cattle, she can't do anything. And if she does, she'll be thrown in jail. Um, so that's, you know, an issue that she has. She can't protect her livelihood. Okay. So with that, um, we're going to do some in-lecture writing. Um, and this will be included as part of your attendance and participation on that Blackboard. So wherever you want to write this, just go ahead and save it and you can add it to the other two questions or one, two other questions I think I have on Blackboard for the participation for this day. Um, so I want you to spend just five minutes writing down some of the critiques that emerge in these videos and not necessarily only in these videos, just other things you might think of or as far as, I mean, the Endangered Species Act is very powerful and has done a lot of good for species conservation, but that doesn't mean it comes without critique. 
Um, so spend about five minutes and write down some of these critiques um, of the Endangered Species Act. Go ahead and pause the video also. Okay, so we'll come back. I'm gonna pretend that I'm gonna act like you have done this. Um, so critiques of the uh, Nature Species Act, I'm sure you wrote down probably quite a few in five minutes. Here's some that I came up with. Um, so it can be seen as prioritizing wildlife over people and their livelihoods. And this point really gets back to values. So whether you think that's a problem or not, it's going to um, depend on your values. If you, you know, as in the video, if you're a person whose livelihood and income is directly impacted by this, then you might very well hold this viewpoint saying, well, hey, why is this frog more important than me and more important than me feeding my family? Um, so that's one critique. You also might see this as a good thing. Um, you say, good, wildlife should be prioritized over people because they're always you know, typically not. Um, so this is really kind of about your values and perspectives for if you think this is a critique or not. Hinders economic development. So this is um, an issue, right? If land needs to be kept in, you know, more of a natural habitat for wildlife or for that endangered species, that can't be used for other things that might bring income or economic development. Obviously, these types of folks who want to use the land in a certain way for their livelihood um, often come in opposition to the ESA. Um, these are kind of the major groups of folks that have to um, contend with ESA regulations. Some, and I'll have some stats on this in a second, some actually argue that the ESA is unsuccessful and has not been effective. So why would you put these laws into place when they're not even working? We'll talk about that in a sec. Um, recovery of small populations can be very expensive. So that's, you know, that's a fair critique. Um, this also does go back to values quite a bit though. Like, is it worth, you know, $3 million to save the Oregon spotted frog? I don't know. That might, it's gonna depend on what you think. Um, some would say yes, and some would say no. Underfunded. So the Fish and Wildlife Service's annual budget for endangered species is only $40 million, which is honestly not that much when you're trying to protect thousands of species. And some also argue that it focuses on controlling land use. And um, this gets back to, you know, protecting species is really about conserving its habitat, their habitat. Um, and that, you know, kind of going back to hindering economic development, it really controls what the land can be used for, which is a critique that some people have. And the definition of take being so broad is another critique of the Endangered Species Act, because take can basically be interpreted to mean anything. Okay, so getting back to that point about how successful it's been, it really depends, um, when I dug around a bit, depends on who you're asking. Um, so these first two groups here, the Center for Biological Diversity and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, spin it in a positive way and say it's been successful. So for the first 40 years, it prevented the extinction of 99% of species under its protection. So 99% of species that were listed did not go, instinct, did not go extinct. Um, and it's resulted in a 90% recovery rate in more than 100 species throughout the U.S. So what those words mean specifically is a little bit up to interpretation, but they're saying that, you know, some species have requ recovered quite significantly, or at least more than 100 species have recovered quite significantly since 1973 when it was implemented. If you talk to the Fish and Wildlife Service, they give a little bit of a different number. They say 98% of lifted species still exist. So 90, whether it's 99%, 98% depends on who you're talking to. Um, and they report that 27 endangered species have been declassified to threatened. Um, 
They don't say how many have been taken off the list completely, but out of 20, 27 species that were, you know, in that more critical endangered species zone have now been delisted to classified. So they count that as a big success. However, these numbers can be flipped around. So this last group, Endangered Species Watch, which I wanted to make sure it was clear that this is part of an independent petroleum association of America. Um, so you kind of know what their take on it's gonna be. They say that of the 295 species that have been listed, only 30 have considered to be recovered. So they, and I find this really interesting. So they say there's only a 2% success rate. So they're saying this is not an effective law. If there's only a 2% success rate, while the Fish and Wildlife Service are saying, hey, 98% of the species still exist. Um, so very different metrics on what you define as success. Um, but it's kind of this only 30 out of 2,000 species and this 2% success rate is really um, some of the groups who are against some of the ESA regulations really kind of lean on those statistics. Um, I don't think those statistics are wrong. I just think that they're using them in a certain way, obviously, to meet their objectives. So last year, the Trump administration made changes to the ESA. Um, these went into effect in September. It's just this last September. Um, and these are kind of some of the major changes that were made. So the government will now consider economic factors. So it's not just about the species biology and habitat. Now economic factors come into play. So what's the economic losses from protecting these species? Um, it's not so surprising given Trump's overall orientation towards the economy. Um, so threatened species, oh, excuse me, <coughs> threatened species will now no longer receive the same protections as endangered species. Um, they will be looked at on a case-to-case -case basis in order for what protections they may receive. Another major change is that the, they define risk to species in the foreseeable future on a case-by-case -case basis. So what this foreseeable future means and what risk means, basically what that says is up for interpretation. Um, it will be decided on a case-to-case -case basis instead of having any standard that goes across to all species. However, these changes are um, not retroactive. So I think I was trying to say here. So for species that are currently listed, their protections will not change. And that's actually pretty key. So these changes will only come to new species um, that are candidates to be listed under the endangered species. These, regulations, these changes to the regulations don't impact species that are already listed. So that's good news at least. So as with a lot of things, there's quite a few um, political cartoons about these changes, which I found fairly humorous. So here you have a tractor, um, bulldozing endangered uh, species act in the protected area. Um, they also tie in immigration to this. Um, and then on the right here, all life is connected almost. Here's two other ones. So here you have the bald eagle, which is kind of the biggest success, for, success story of the Endangered Species Act. Um, and he's lamenting that the Endangered Species Act is now extinct um, next to the dodo bird and the passenger pigeon. Um, <laughs> It's hilarious. And then here on the right, um, it's kind of the story of the big bad wolf. So grandma, what big anti-wolf myths you have? And grandma says, the better to delist you with, my dear. And then we've talked about a lot of those anti-wolf myths in, the, in our class, so I found that one appropriate as well. Just with anything that's kind of a political decision, there are a lot of comics out there, and I think they're interesting to look at. So, these amendments were changed, announced in August, and took effect in September of last year. Um, but as far as what's happening now, I honestly had a hard time finding information on this because 
the news media has been so dominated by a the election and the democratic primaries uh, and then in the last two months pretty much only the only news you could find is on COVID-19 um so there's not a lot as far as what's going on um the little bit that I could find and I have some information on this is that there's um litigation going on so there's lawsuits against these changes from states and from environmental organizations to the federal government so last video of the day this actually video is in san diego and it talks about how california is becoming one of 17 states that's suing the federal government over these changes in the endangered species act um, and it talks specifically about um, one instance in, in san diego um, so please go ahead and watch this it's really good example of local how the endangered species act is impacting local conservation efforts and how california which is really always on the forefront of environmental legislation um, is still there they're still one of them in the forefront as far as suing the federal government over these changes in the endangered species act so go ahead and watch this video once again if you type in the title you should find it or if you type in um, the actual url Here's, welcome back, here's a summary. Um, so, as I said, California has joined other states to file a lawsuit, um, particularly because these rollbacks um, focus on the economics and cost of protection because they also kind of don't take into account the impacts of climate change. So these are some of the two sticking points for why um, in some of the, in, you know, in this lawsuit for why they're suing the Endangered Species Act. Okay, with that, I think that kept that pretty concise um, with the videos a little bit longer. Um, so to complete today's lecture, just for the last two lectures we had, go to Blackboard, go to the discussion section, and there's a section there held April 13th, Participation, Endangered Species Act. Um, click on it, create your own thread, and then answer the questions that I have there, and that's your participation credit for this lecture. And a few people asked me about due dates. So this is, should be completed before the next lecture, whether that be the next Wednesday or the next Monday. So this does give you some time and some flexibility for when you actually watch the lecture um, and when you complete this really short activity. Once again, if you're not clear on this, please do send me an email asking me questions you might have. So for Wednesday, we're gonna focus on water conservation. Um, I have two readings. They're both fairly short. So one's the Clean Water Act. And then one, um, this reading, don't get, in, don't get intimidated. It's this whole basically book. But I just want you to read chapter one, which is pages three through seven. So if you open this up and think, oh, it's 200 pages, it's not actually 200 pages I want you to read. But because agriculture is one of the huge contributors to water pollution worldwide, um, I wanted to include this as part of the reading. So go ahead and read that. You can read more if you want, but three to seven is really what we focus on, and then the Clean Water Act. We do have a discussion leader exercise on Wednesday. So if you're a discussion leader, make sure you have your questions posted by class time, and then everyone else has 24 hours to respond to that. Um, and also, luckily, um, I know you all requested more guest speakers, and that can be a little bit challenging given the current situation, but I do have um, a friend I was able to coax into being a guest speaker. Um, he's located in Colorado, so he's not local here to San Diego, but he works for an organization called the Western Resource Advocates. Um, and they do work, conservation work, all over the West, um, not in California directly, but they do do a lot with um, Colorado water, Colorado River water, sorry. So that's very relevant to us and to San Diego. Um, and his job is, what uh, is as a water policy analyst i don't did not spell that right <laughs> um, but he's going to speak directly to you know what his job is what he does so you can get a little bit better idea of you know someone who's in this field who does water policy work what do they actually do what kind of successes has he had um, and i've asked him to speak some about you know 
career opportunities and jobs for folks who might want to go into this field. So Wednesday's lecture is going to be two parts, just kind of like last Wednesday's lecture was. So make sure you watch both, um, both videos. And with that, thank you. Um, once again, any questions, let me know and have a good rest of your day.